Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the National Museum of the American Indian. My name is Elizabeth Gish, and I work with museum programs here at NMAI. We're delighted to, pre to present today's program, Impacts of Climate Change, Our Rivers and Coasts, a very important topic, and we have some fine speakers I'm really looking forward to hearing. Um, before we begin the program, just a few housekeeping remarks. If you have a cell phone with you, please turn it off or silence it. Uh, we are webcasting, and um, we don't want to disturb the program. And welcome to our webcast audience also. Um, it is my great pleasure now to introduce Larry McDermott, who will moderate the program and will also um, be speaking to us um, as a presenter. Larry McDermott is Algonquin from Eastern Ontario, Canada. He serves as Executive Director of Plenty Canada, an Indigenous non-government organization with the mandate to serve Indigenous peoples locally, regionally, and internationally in achieving sustainable development and environmental protection goals. McDermott was his First Nations uh, inaugural representative to the Algonquin claim process and serves as ambassador for his community to various functions, including international processes such as the United Nations Convention on Biodiversity, very important roles. Um, McDermott is one of two Aboriginal members of the Ontario Human Rights Commission and serves on the Aboriginal Steering Committee. He is a member of the Ontario Species at Risk Public Advisory Committee, which provides oversight of Ontario government-sponsored efforts for species at risk. Please help me welcome Larry McDermott. Thank you. Larry. Miigwech, or thank you, Elizabeth. Kwe Kwe, Wamsi Indigenous Cause. My Algonquin name is uh, Wamsi, and uh, I'm pleased to share with you uh, these three stories. Uh, just, I want to say one thing uh, about this, this topic, and I don't think that there's any other topic that threatens uh, our collective future. Uh, it's something that Indigenous peoples around the world are impacted by, and there are many, many stories. Well, we're privileged today, um, and I am privileged today, to hear uh, my, my brother and sister's story and, and share my story about the impact of climate change on our environment, on our traditional uh, food sources, uh, and on our sacred elements. Um, I'm also, I want to, to honor each, and one, uh, each one of you who has taken the time to join us today. There are so many things going on, uh, but you've chosen to share with us. So we look forward to your questions at the end uh, or your comments because I see it less a presentation and more a sharing. So that's what we want to do with you and we look forward to that portion uh, of this event. I'm going to start now by introducing Eli Enns, who is uh, Klaquit, and uh, you can judge my pronunciation <laughs> later. Um, he's a political science who has specialized in Canadian constitutional law, international dispute resolution, and comprehensive land uh, claims in British Columbia, something I've done in Ontario. Uh, since 2005, Eli has worked in Calicut sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island in a variety of areas ranging from physical development projects, some that I find very interesting, including community infrastructure and commercial residential construction project management, to land use planning programs, economic development, restorative justice initiatives, and most recently Eli served for an 18-month term as the administrator administrator of his tribe or First Nation. He is currently co-directing the Tribal Parks Initiative in a volunteer capacity there and working with domestic and international partners in the Canadian Africa Learning and Research Alliance. Um, I know a lot more of what uh, Eli is doing, uh, but I'm going to turn things over to Eli. Eli, would you please come up?
Thank you, Larry. <clears throat> and I'd like to echo Larry's uh, thank you to you for joining us and spending your time. And certainly with a smaller group like this, we can, we can have a lot of time for exchange, comments, and questions because we're dealing with a lot of, um, I think, very sensitive issues and also very complex issues. So as Larry mentioned, I'm on the west coast, so just south of Alaska as a, as a reference point for many of you. I want to talk today about uh, how our communities are engaging in sustainable development initiatives with the um, being informed by information that's coming in to us about climate change. Information that's coming into us and also observations of our uh, people who are in the field and working in the traditional territory. So I'd like to begin by just giving a context for my words and for the work that I do. Uh, my primary role in life primary role is as a father, and so these are my children um, in the traditional territory. The two guys up here graduating here are in the audience. So I'm just going to point at them there with the green thing. <laughs> uh, very proud of my children, and that's, uh, that's a very, they've, in fact, they've been very big teachers in my life. Uh, my oldest daughter just graduated high school, and when she was young, she, she taught me a lot. Um, and those teachings that I receive from my children, I carry with me in the work that I do. As a political scientist, making maps, making our own maps is a very important process. It was a it was a big step forward for us. So this is a, if you, if you came to the west coast of Vancouver Island, many of the maps that you would see are a, very different from this map that you're looking at here. This map delineates the traditional territory of our, of our nation on the west coast of Vancouver Island. All of these dozens and dozens of place names tell a story about our relationship to this land. It's not a story, we don't name, in, in our tradition, we don't name places after people. Um, people are named after places, and a lot of these names are descriptive and explanatory names in our language, which tell a story about the relationship that we've had to our traditional territory in the past, what resources can be used in those places, and, and also how those places are changing over time. So the, the place names that we have for our traditional territory are intimately bound up with our world view and our relationship to our lands and waters. As a political scientist, um, I've, I've learned through, in university that maps are very significant instruments or tools in political symbology. And for us to, instead of looking at uh, maps of our traditional territory that are broken up in grids and tree farms and mining tenures and other values being expressed onto the landscape, uh, it was a big step forward for us to create maps that captured our values and captured the history and our, captured our relationship with our traditional territory. So this is, uh, so going from, going from a place of living the traditional lifestyle, which is something that's more or less outdated now, to a place of actually managing our landscapes, doing resource management, economic development, um, and ecosystem services in our traditional territory. A part of taking that step from the past and into the future with those same values in mind is the process of making our own maps. So that's a very significant thing to note in the evolution of our, of our uh, self-governance on the West Coast. So as an, as an instrument, 
as a mechanism for regional economic development and watershed management, we've uh, coined the term in our traditional territory of tribal parks. Tribal parks are different than national parks in Canada, and they're different than provincial parks or regional parks, because in tribal parks we do account for sustainable livelihoods. We do see a role, a healthier role, for human economy and human communities in ecosystems. So to operationalize the concept, we can think about what tribal parks as an indigenous watershed management area which implements a traditional governance system includes everyone includes all of our asthma all of our stakeholders and it's also as I mentioned a mechanism for ensuring um, the persistence of sustainable livelihoods in our traditional territory this is a very uh, very significant crest in the Nuchan Health Governance System. My uncle Joe Martin always tells me every time we have a meal together that our constitution is captured in our totem poles. And so all of these crests represent law system. They, they, are, they represent knowledge patterns in the value system and the, the rules of conduct are captured in those crests. And those are the stories and the knowledge patterns that are captured in those um, artistic representations are passed down from generation to generation in a process called hahopa. And the, the process of hahopa begins at the time your life is conceived and it continues to the time that you die. Um, it's important to mention because these crests carry a lot of knowledge with them that informs a healthier way of coexisting with other plants and animals in our traditional territory. And those crests and those knowledge patterns also inform us about uh, a value system that can aid us in adapting to climate change as, uh, as that um, uh, folds out, unfolds in our traditional territory. Uh, very briefly, some of the, the concepts in the New Chanoth language that have informed the development of indigenous watershed management areas. Uh, when, when we were debating developments in tribal parks within our own community, one of the elders came up to me after I spoke and he said to me, when you talk about tribal parks and when you talk about the bioregional economic development uh, initiatives that you're undertaking, what it sounds like to me in our language is tichmis hukhin. And very simply, tichmis hukhin is the core of our being, it's the core of our life, it's what sustains us physically, it what's, it what, it's what sustains our biophysical processes, and it's also what sustains us spiritually. So Tichmis Hukhin is a good way of understanding tribal parks and what we're trying to achieve with that land management approach. We also have this concept here, which is Kuas, which is a neutral worldview of humanity. And the definition and the knowledge patterns that go with that concept are very important for orientating ourselves in the natural world in orientating ourselves in past, present, and future. A few words about kuas. The, the first pattern that comes, the first knowledge pattern that comes with the word kuas is that we are all real, live human beings. Real as opposed to imagined or dreamt. Alive as opposed to dead. And human beings as opposed to any other animal in the natural world. As human beings, we have access to a full range of emotions, love, uh, jealousy, hatred, all the different emotions that we have, we have access to, and those are gifts from our Creator. No matter what you're feeling at any point in your life, it's okay. Those emotions are like a language, the language of humanity. 
And it's okay to feel those things, just don't get stuck. And for me, that's a really important lesson, and it's come into my life and also my work life in, at many different times, um, because we have a tendency as human beings to get stuck. And, um, <clears throat> and then we, we, our judgment becomes clouded. Uh, one last, you know, in terms of kuas, uh, the, the third knowledge pattern that comes with that is that we are a link between our ancestors of the past and our ancestors in the future. And so that's a very important concept for orientating ourselves in terms of what I call an intergenerational sense of accountability, which is a very intangible kind of accountability, but it's very significant and it's, and it's um, very uh, consequential. So we have many concepts here. And all of these different uh, traditional concepts have played into the development of tribal parks in different ways. Um, probably most importantly to the idea of climate change is the concepts of hishukish tsawak, which is um, everything is one and everything is interconnected. Uh, it's all, it also can be better understood, perhaps, as the current expression of the original source of creation in a Nuchanoth worldview. And this Kwekwiksup is a vertical um, concept, very similar to Hisha Kishtzawak. Kwekwiksup is talking about the, the sort of temporal aspect of connectivity, where our past, present, and future are connected. And so these are, these are very, you know, simple concepts, very important concepts for orientating ourselves in the work that we do. And, uh, you know, Grandmother Mary Hayes always said that the teachings of our ancestors are simple yet powerful. So these things are important to mention. Uh, Larry mentioned that I'm a Canadian political scientist, so in order to um, overcome the geopolitical challenges that we have in our traditional territory. We've gone about educating ourselves about the history of our state, the state that we exist in, uh, Canada. And we've gone back and we've educated ourselves about uh, the Royal Proclamation of 1763, the, the acts of chivalry and, and the promises made by King George. Uh, to the Indian nations of North America following the, the Seven Years' War. In particular, in British Columbia, we, because we're here on the west coast of Vancouver Island, we made a point of educating ourselves about the, the terms of union. So, so in terms of uh, geopolitical processes and climate change, it's important to understand the development of the state, how decision making happens, where are the, um, the, the lines of authority between constitutional law, federal law and provincial law, and where do our own traditional governance institutions and authorities come into play in terms of making decisions in the best interests of future ancestors and what we have to um, provide for in a climbing, in a, sorry, a changing world. Uh, <clears throat> for us, our, our relationship with the state escalated in, in 1985 with the blockades and the Mears Island court case. So in our community, we do have a healthy history of litigation. Uh, we just f successfully litigated the, the federal government in a fisheries case recently called the New Channel Fisheries case, and we've, um, we were successful in litigating the province. But we're not, um, we're not solely um, determined to litigate. We're opening up other aspects of political negotiations, as well as the Tribal Parks Initiative, which is not, a, it's not an aggressive mandate. Tribal Parks is about implementing the traditional values of Uyathlak Asma and Uyathlak Nish. In 2010, we worked with international groups in our traditional territory and we invited people from all around the world 
to create the Opitzat Declaration, which is essentially saying that uh, in our traditional territory, we have a right, but more importantly, we have a responsibility to manage our traditional territory in a way that is best for future ancestors. So in terms of organizational development, uh, we, for our strategic management planning, we developed a vision statement of where we, where we want to go as a community, as a nation, and we developed the mission statement for how to get there. So in terms of climate change, you can see that reestablishing a healthy integration of economy in, and environment is very important. We, we don't think of economic development as necessarily a harmful thing. If you do it well, you can create sustainable livelihoods. Um, and you can also limit the impact and in fact go, go beyond limiting to uh, harness the physical development process and harness the economic development process to actually create benefits in the environment. Biological diversity is important for maintaining life and to mimic that biological diversity and to act respectfully towards it, we have to create a diverse economy. And how we achieve those things is through practicing the teachings of our ancestors, working respectfully and including all of the stakeholders in our economic development strategies. So we work closely with the municipality of Tofino, uh, Parks Canada, uh, provincial agencies, uh, nonprofit organizations, and other institutions and individuals. One of the core programmatic themes in the Tribal Parks Initiative is Niwas Nish Nisma, Restorative Justice Program. And so, in terms of um, preparing for climate change, the Niwas Nish Nisma Restorative Justice Program is very important because it's about reconnecting people with places. And you need to have that relationship. You need to be aware of the change that's happening in the land uh, in order to be able to make appropriate decisions. So the Niwas Nish Nisma Restorative Justice Program is about connecting people to landscapes. And people who are connected to a place are more likely to make better decisions when it comes to the governance of those places. Our, our map making abilities evolved and uh, about four or five years ago we created this map. We're very proud of this map because we envisioned a lot of innovation for our economic development. Here in Tofino, which is a resort municipality, we already have had uh, a decade plus experience in conventional tourism industry. We have a successful resort here, whale watching, um, surfing, these kinds of things. But now we're getting into energy production, ecotourism, and other educational tourism initiatives. So we've been, we've been um, selling energy through a renewable energy project to the province of British Columbia now for two years. And the zip line, I would encourage you all to come and check it out. It's, uh, it's quite an adventure. Both Brendan and Ian were on it, and I went on it myself. It's, it's quite exhilarating. And we have our, our tribal parks guardians who are, um, who are uh, guides on the zip line. And very simply, the, the, the dominant management areas here, Kwasin Hup, is all ancient cedar rainforest. So, so we have some of the biggest trees in the world, very big uh, thousand year old plus trees. And we've decided that that's very important to preserve for now as, we, as climate change unfolds. There's a lot of biodiversity in here. This Uyathlak Nish area has been highly impacted by conventional logging practices and other unhealthy development processes. So we're in the process of uh, of um, restoring those lands and doing alternative econ economic development there. 
Moving forward, one of the biggest challenges to success here in, in implementing these alternative strategies is a paradigm shift in the legislative reform that's required for enabling those alternative approaches to happen. We've had a lot of successes and there's still some challenges we're working through. So this is the end of my presentation and I'll just leave you with this, uh, this image from our traditional territory. These traditional dugout canoes are, can only be made from trees that are 800 years old plus, the ancient cedars. And uh, this is a view out looking out into the Pacific Ocean. Out further here is Japan and here is the resort municipality. And the name of this island here is called Chatsa. And uh, in our language that means um, a wave break for when the big tsunami comes in. No, okay. So thank you for the presentation and ciao. Chu. Thank you, Eli. Uh, I thought we had to wait a long time for our materials for a canoe. <laughs> wait till I bring that back home. Um, our next speaker, uh, give me a second here, is uh, Tina Taskett, a member of the Siletz uh, Conve uh, Confederation of uh, Indian Tribes of Oregon, if I've got that right. Uh, she was employed with the tribe for nearly 25 years, uh, serving in several roles. Uh, she's worked as a human resources manager at Chinook Winds Casino Resort, and for the last nine years of tribal employment, she served as the assistant general manager. Recently, she served as project coordinator for the newly developed Res Kitchen Tour, a multi-tribal culinary competition and showcase. She was elected to the Siletz City Council and served for three and a half years before being elected to the Siletz Tribal Council in February 2008. Her task at serves as a council representative to numerous boards and committees, including the Economic Development uh, Committee. Tina? Thank you so much for taking um, time today to spend time with us. Um, earlier we were joking and I was told I was the rose between two thorns. And I can tell you that it's very difficult to come in. I'm not in the sciences in any way, but I am a user of our traditional foods. And so when asked to speak about a topic and my topic was, about red tides and how and the changes climate changes and how it's affecting our traditional food sources i went first to our natural resources staff and asked them to put a presentation together they did a fine job which i'm going to share with you and then following that i'm going to talk about in layman terms what does that really mean for us as the user um, science is very important and i would um, I would challenge you that um, science isn't always in, in um, the traditional um, realm. Uh, Native people have used the sciences since time immemorial in many ways. And so some of the sciences that we use aren't always um, recognized. And um, I'm very happy to share a little bit with you, but I can tell you I'm only going to speak about just the tip of, of the issue, and there's so much more. And I think the piece that's the most important to share with you is how each and every one of these pieces makes up part of the whole. And you cannot talk about um, science bases and, and um, ecology without looking at so many different areas because they all flow together. And I think Eli did a very good job of talking about that and how they, the, um, all of these aspects are important to look at and not just one. 
Before I start, though, I just wanted to say a couple of thank yous to first to um, the young people and what I consider the young people that are here today. Uh, Eli's children um, were so gracious to visit with me before we started. And I think it's important to have them here because they're going to, they're, they hear and they absorb more than what we realize. And for me, I wanna say thanks to one of my young people, uh, Peter Hatch, who's actually, Peter, can you wave? Peter's doing um, um, an assignment with the Smithsonian and he's been through college and received his degree. And for me, it's important for our young people to seek out that education and combine that with the education that they get home culturally from their ancestors. And I wouldn't be, I would be remiss if I didn't also thank the um, people who teach me on a regular basis, the people who came before me and shared with me their knowledge, and um, hopefully some of what I'm able to share with those folks that come behind me. And I couldn't understand and do what I do without their sharing with me from the start. So with that, I'm gonna jump in and, and I'm gonna go through their presentation fairly quickly because it's pretty scientific and for those people who are scientific, you'll really appreciate it. And for those of you that are more like me, um, you'll tolerate it and get to the other discussion. So um, from a science perspective, um, our natural resources staff thought that, that these are some of the potential impacts on the resources that we use on a regular basis. And um, I, I'm really pleased because our natural resources staff has been doing a lot of estuary studies to the point that um, they have go other governmental agencies coming in and contracting with our staff to do some research for them in their local area. So I'm really happy that we've reached that level and there's quite a bit of recognition for the work that's done in the past. Um, the, some of the impacts, part of what I was asked to talk about is red tide and its impacts, but also um, the changes in the environment, in the ocean and the near ocean and the shoreline that impacts um, our traditional foods. And there's, uh, there's already been a sea level rise, but there is predicted to be more, and uh, which will continue to have a domino effect on our food resources. Um, their discussion was talking about the differences in the impact of the waves and um, the ocean temperatures during a, a normal year and an El Nino year. El Nino is when the, uh, uh, there's change in direction of the, the tides. There's also a change in the temperature. These are uh, areas that are actually near to the Salets tribe. And you can see from um, the red area, the impacts that have happened during the El Nino years. And those temperature changes and um, the change in the, the uh, wave patterns affects the shoreline which affects the, it, it causes erosion. Uh, you can see slightly here that a lot of the communities that, that have grown up on the shoreline have started to put riprack or large rocks trying to stabilize um, the, the sand so that there isn't great change. But with, um, with the El Nino and the change in the weather and the tectronics and all of the other things that impact it, there are changes in the environment. Um, part, of, part of what happens for us is with the warming of the temperature, our, some of our primary food sources, of course, are salmon and eels and, and certainly 
shellfish and, and um, things like sea anemones and sea cucumbers and a lot of other things that we eat out of the ocean are affected by that temperature change. And um, one of the things that he's of great, he is our natural resources fisheries gentleman, is quite concerned with, and that's as the temperature changes, it changes our streams, our inland streams and rivers. And that change means that some of our fish are, are hatching at the wrong time. And as they hatch and those um, small salmon are, are entering the, the salmon, the, I'm sorry, the streams and eventually the ocean, they're finding it at a time when there's no food for them. So that results in fewer fish that survive, more fish for predators, and fewer fish for us as a food source. Um, if you look at that, the circles represent the areas that um, steelhead, which is one of another of our food sources, um, is, is known to uh, be found. And in the plus areas, it's um, these are areas that are affected by the seas that that um, cause the steelhead to uh, either not grow or mature because their, their habitat is changing. And it's also causing them to shift where they grow and mature. And when those food sources move out of our local area, then we no longer literally have a food source. Um, one of the things that um, occurs in the environment, and some of it is it, it occurs with the red tide. A red tide is an algae formation, a large formation, and algae occurs normally, but it also can be um, inf uh, influenced by its environment. If the temperature changes, it causes more algae to form. If uh, it's if uh, non-traditional um, ingredients are introduced, such as from farming or industrial use, into the environment, this algae grows. And when the algae grows in large quantities, sometimes it forms what we call a red tide, and it's called that from the color, but it's a toxin that will kill not only the um, clams and shellfish and other things that we eat, but for the, the shellfish and the, the food sources that aren't literally killed by the red tide, they become toxins for the humans that may eat them. Um, with, with global warming and the warming of the environment, these um, red tides are predicted to increase, which will result in more toxins to the, the species that are trying to reproduce, more toxins that may be eaten by humans causing more death. One of our other food sources is lamprey eel. And it's thought that lamprey may survive better than the salmon. However, um, the adult lamprey can live in a warmer environment, but the juvenile lamprey are affected by the storm. So as you have temperature changes and changes in your weather patterns, it may destroy the habitat that the juveniles need in order to survive. Um, all of our animals, and I think most of you are probably aware of this, all of our animals live in an ecological balance and they depend on each other. So when you have changes in the weather, then you have changes in the ability of these animals to survive. And um, they have to migrate to areas where they can get their food. And again, we have defined areas that we uh, live in and that we gather from, and if our food sources move out of there, then it's less food for us. And that's the scientific base, and now I want to talk about what happens on the ground. I'm, I said I'm not a scientist, and I'm not, but I am a gatherer, and I am somebody that goes out into the environment 
and gathers everything from berries to shellfish to roots to deer and elk and all of those things that we use to sustain us. And I'm going to talk just briefly about what has happened in our environment. Um, the Siletz tribe, unlike some tribes, has had their hunting and fishing rights diminished by a consent decree that was required of us um, by the state of Oregon in order for our tribe to be restored. We were a terminated tribe, although we had seven ratified treaties and one unratified and an executive order creating our reservation, we uh, were terminated in the mid-1950s and restored to federal recognition in 1977. But in, in when our tribe, tribe's original reservation was created, it was over 1.3 million acres of some of the most beautiful timberland and shorelines, which was very rich in resources in many ways not only for our housing, but our food and all of the things that we do on a regular basis. Um, Post-termination, um, all of that was gone. There was none of it left. In 1977, it restored us to federal recognition, but did not return any of the lands. In order for us to receive any of our lands back, we were forced into this consent decree that limited the amount of fish and uh, deer and elk and um, all of the other resources and it's governed by this consent degree and it gives the state of Oregon great latitude in what they allow us to do. Um, it also causes some uh, some conflicts as you can imagine as we interpret it and they interpret it and occasionally such as now we're not in agreement of how that is interpreted. Um, one of the things that is limited is that the state will not allow us to fish on our river that our reservation that runs through our reservation we're only allowed to fish on the tributaries the state of oregon is um, has the right to determine what our fishing season is and we're only allowed to fish by dip net or gaff hook um, we're not allowed any of the other ways of fishing. But um, one of the things that affects us is the state sets that time frame when we're able to uh, gather or fish. And um, unfortunately, with climate change, the streams and the tributaries are not filling up with water. As the season get, is changing and the water no longer flows when it used to, um, the fish are not returning in the time frame that we're allowed to fish. We have 4,800 tribal members, and last year there were only two fish caught during the fishing season. And that's certainly not going to feed anybody. Um, most of the fish that do make it up to the areas that we're allowed to fish in um, either are too old or um, just don't make it up in the time frames. And so you can see how that's negatively impacting our ability to sustain ourselves. Um, the other things that affect it are this warming trend. And there was a time period, um, at least in my family, when um, I was the person that they asked to tell them when the berries were ready, when we should be picking, and we would gather for the winter. Um, I could predict those times within a fairly um, close window, but with climate change, what we're seeing is those things are not happening when they used to, and I cannot no longer predict those times. We spend a lot of time going out and looking and watching and waiting, and sometimes those berries don't come on because of the environment, because of what's happened in the environment. Sometimes we don't have enough sun. We have more rain than we used to have, or we have no rain. So all of these changes are affecting everything that we do. Um, there was a cycle of, of gathering that we would follow, and, and I'm certainly not the only one. There were many, many, many people throughout the tribe, uh, particularly older people who would designate when it was time and where to go, and um, those times are much harder to predict because the weather patterns are changing so substantially. Um, what it has done is um, caused us to look at our partnerships and where we could form them. 
Um, we've had some good results working with our Forest Service and BLM and some of those other governmental agencies to um, reestablish some of our food sources. Some of those food sources have been impacted not only by the consent decree, but by the different industries that have been there, particularly uh, fishing and logging and some of those other industries which have had an impact on our traditional resources. So we're trying to work with these partnerships to help uh, open those doors again. I can say from a user standpoint, one of the things that's been very important to us is to take our children with us as we go out and begin to gather and show them some of these traditional food sources that they haven't had contact with in their lifetime. And for us, um, since the early 1950s. So it's very important to reestablish those things. And I'm, I'm thankful to say we've made some headway, but we need to continue to work with our agencies, um, NOAA and EPA and all of the different agencies that work on the environment because it directly affects us. And um, we want to continue to gather. We want to continue to do what we do. We're impacted by the number of people in our environment. Um, the, there's so many more people accessing our resources, particularly the mussels and the clams and the crab and the shellfish and all of the things that we use it as a traditional source. So there's a need to work together to ensure that our, our rights under our treaties and our needs for subsistence um, continue to be recognized. But we also have a responsibility to take our children with us and teach them how to gather those things and to do it in a way that doesn't negatively impact our environment. With that, I'll close and I thank you very much for taking the time to hear me today. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Okay, I'm going to take a, a similar approach to Tina in that um, I'm, I'm going to start out with kind of a Western science uh, perspective, but uh, on uh, the impact of the American eel uh, through climate change, let me uh, just uh, quickly give a little bit of background. Uh, the eel is uh, a source of food, uh, medicines, material, uh, waterproof bags, etc., even the backings of our wampum belts. And um, among uh, our people, there are uh, oral stories that, uh, that tell us that the, the eel links us not only uh, to other Algonquin communities, but to indigenous communities uh, throughout the hemisphere. Uh, those stories um, showed that our ancestors were aware of not only the fact that others throughout the, the hemisphere relied upon the eel, uh, but that we had a responsibility, which uh, I'll get into here in a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna show you a few slides uh, that are more of a science-focused uh, approach, and then I'm gonna add to that afterwards. Okay. Um, the American eel, or an Algonquin pimazee, uh, has an amazing life cycle. Um, they spend most of their lives in fresh water, but they spawn in the Sargasso Sea, and you can see by looking at the map, uh, it's, well, you can see Bermuda, and it gives you some sense of where the Sargasso Sea is. The, um, the eel from our territory produced 20 million eggs. Um, the eel, for example, from Chesapeake Bay would produce about a million eggs. So that meant that um, and almost all of the eel in our territory were female. So uh, that meant that they are very important to the range. Now, um, I wanted to show the entire range, but it was difficult to get a map, but let me just express it this way. The eel can be found in South America, uh, Central America, and as you can see, uh, Greenland, Northern Labrador, and they have the ability 
to go up very small streams, even if necessary, go over land for a short distance. Uh, they're amazing creatures. Uh, give you some sense of how important uh, they were. Um, the Jesuit uh, relations uh, in the 1600s reflected on when all other sources of food fail, we can always rely on the eel. The eel, because of their fat content, um, stored remarkably well, um, much longer than any other source of protein. And uh, even just a few years ago, were the most valuable commercial fish in Canada. Uh, this is a, a quick look at uh, uh, what the American eel looks like. I'm going to mention that there's also a European eel and a Japanese eel. The European eel spawns in the Sargasso Sea as well, but is a distinct species. Uh, the Japanese eel spawns elsewhere. Uh, this is uh, its life cycle, and um, briefly, uh, at different stages of its life uh, cycle, particularly as it's maturing, the silver eel, the yellow eel, all produced very different medicines, um, and it's incredible the diversity uh, and applications of those medicines. Population status and, and decline. Uh, it was, as I mentioned, um, it was actually you know, it almost, uh, it was over 50% of the biomass uh, in Lake Ontario uh, and the St. Lawrence uh, River at the time of contact, um, according to Western science estimates. Um, in our area, since the 1980s, the population has dropped by over 99%. Uh, the time this was put together, it said as much as, but it's declined more since then. Uh, today, in Ontario, under the Un Ontario's Endangered Species Act, and I sit on the board that oversees endangered species, uh, it's been listed as endangered, which means it cannot be harvested uh, without uh, being in conflict with the law. Um, and nor can it be harmed, however, uh, hydro facilities and hydro dams are the habitat issue that is has the most severe impact on the survival of uh, American eel. And the problem is, it's when they go back to the Sargasso Sea. They can get around, uh, in some cases, some of the dams up some of the streams, but it's when they have to travel, I'm going to convert it to miles, 3,500 miles, to the Sargasso Sea from our territory, they're going to take the fast bus. That means the quickest currents. That means they're going to go through the turbines. And so the survival rate, uh, we did studies on uh, the uh, chances of survival uh, in certain watersheds. And if there's more than two dams, it's less than 1%. Uh, we also have issues that are a factor of climate change. We have shifting ocean currents. Uh, we have a deviation and a weakening of the Gulf Stream system in the North, uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation. We have changes uh, in natural freshwater flow and, and regulation re regimes. Give you some idea, uh, I live on the uh, Mississippi, which flows into the Ottawa, uh, Canadian Mississippi, it's a lot smaller. Uh, and uh, we are now in the third summer of water advisories. That means everybody is asked to reduce their water consumption. We're at a level two. Uh, we'll probably next week be into a level three. That is very, that demands very severe reductions in use of water, including by uh, commercial industrial users. Uh, that's a big deal. Um, we've watched uh, the climate change dramatically. A uh, good friend of mine, Jeff Beaver from Alderville First Nation, and I a few years ago in January uh, went fishing uh, and trapping on the river at his or lake, Rice Lake, at his reserve, and there was no ice in January. Uh, we just basically took what would have been a spring holiday in the middle of the winter. Uh, those kinds of unusual events are happening with regularity. 
Um, we also have issues of uh, reduction in, in nutrients and, and marine productivity. Um, that's a, a whole story about, uh, again, what I would refer to in Algonquin as Gina Way Daganuk. That's the web of life and all the relations, uh, relationships to it. Well, um, plankton, which is fundamental to uh, the health and well-being of uh, ocean ecosystems, uh, is on the decline. It's on the decline because of climate change factors, including the acidification of the ocean. And the acidification is compounded by climate change, uh, a story I could probably talk at, at length about, but uh, we'll just we'll touch on it here. Um, there's also uh, reduced health and reproductive capacity uh, due to pollution uh, issues. Beluga whales in the upper St. Lawrence River um, have relied on the American eel as a source of, uh, of food uh, forever. And the beluga whales are now so toxic, and it's a factor of, because the American eel, uh, because of its heavy f uh, fat content, is a, is re becomes a, um, a vector for uh, contaminants. And I was at uh, uh, actually a Canadian uh, US working group on the American eel in which more and more uh, Native Americans and First Nations are participating and uh, what it revealed in terms of uh, the way we're living on, on Mother Earth and the impact that it's having on the eel. And you know it's having that same impact on several other species, including ourselves. Um, habitat alteration, the biggest one, of course, are the dams. And there are par parasites as well. Okay, traditional resource use. I really I touched on it, uh, but one of the things we've done, we're the first, we're the only uh, First Nation. That's the term we use in Canada uh, to be involved in a comprehensive claim, at least as far as I know, east of the Rockies. We never we live on unceded territory. As a consequence, we've had to do a lot of archaeological work, genealogical work, et cetera. But that has uh, uh, provided us with a wealth of information about how our ancestors uh, fished and fished eel. And uh, it's the, the, some of the technology involved. Uh, in short, I'm going to just, what you see up there are different kinds of spears. The spear, the second one, from the left would be a summer spear. I do not see a winter spear here, but a winter spear was designed to take uh, the younger females rather than the older ones that they, that uh, uh, Algonquin people, other Mi'kmaq did it as well, and several other uh, uh, First Nations. But it was actually designed with conservation in mind. It was designed. Uh, to ensure that the most productive uh, females and the ones who would be spawning uh, the soonest, and I should have mentioned that their life cycle, they would go spawn on average somewhere between uh, 16, 17 years and 25 years of age. So those eel were spared by the design of the spear. Um, okay, these are some of the things I've already touched on. Um, recovery st uh, strategy. And I like uh, some of the things that uh, both uh, Eli and Tina have said about working uh, with our neighbors, and that's uh, critically important in terms of uh, restoring species. And res now uh, in Ontario, we're taking more of a habitat approach, something that uh, First Nations advocated for a long time in Ontario, and they've listened. And that's an approach we'll be taking in the future, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm delighted because when you take a habitat approach, you can remedy the negative impacts on several species at once rather than one by one. Um, the, uh, uh, we're, we recognize that we'll, we'll probably can't achieve, certainly even in a, in a matter of a few generations, uh, restoration to uh, uh, previous abundance levels. But uh, for us, 
uh, in working with uh, others in Ontario on the recovery strategy for the American eel. Uh, there were representatives from the commercial fishing industry who had their goal, but our goal was to be able to uh, uh, restore the relationship in all of our communities that had a relationship to the eel before. So that means getting them upstream where they aren't, uh, aren't uh, in existence anymore um, and ensuring that uh, uh, the relationship, even if it's ceremonial and even if it's, uh, it doesn't have a significant uh, uh, economic uh, relationship, but at least uh, that that species, which meant so much to Algonquin people in the past, at least that relationship to some degree is, is restored. Um, and that's what, meant, what is meant by the full cultural relationship. Uh, we also recognize that the eel is the wolf of the watershed and it helps protect biodiversity. One of the things that uh, there, some research that's been done uh, on the eel and the relationship to invasive alien species is that the eel uh, is amazingly efficient in cleaning up certain in invasive species. Uh, that's an interesting story in itself, but so it's it's not just about hanging on to a species; it's about hanging on to um, an ecosystem that functions and that uh, the the job the creator gave to a species like the eel is incredibly important, and if it's lost, it has profound impacts. Okay, uh, we have some references. I, I want to touch on uh, a, a few things. Um, I mentioned that uh, our Algonquin territory is unceded. It's a, approximately 9 million acres in eastern Ontario, and it includes access to the St. Lawrence River, uh, the Ottawa watershed, and, um, uh, and I'm referring to the Ontario side. There's also the, uh, the Quebec side. Uh, in working with the, the eel uh, and dealing with the impacts, including climate change and, and habitat uh, destruction, it's brought us together uh, with uh, our neighbors and with other uh, indigenous uh, tribes uh, as far east as the Mi'kmaq, uh, the Haudenosaunee, um, and, and others. And uh, uh, we've uh, as a result of, of working on the impact of the eel and, uh, and considering what it means to our communities, it's brought us together. We have a landmark Supreme Court decision that recognized uh, treaty rights. And it was, um, that court case was referred to as the Marshall case, and that's Donald Marshall. Well, Donald came uh, and, and worked with us, including on looking at projects to uh, restore the relationship of uh, youth to the eel. But he said in, uh, at the Odawa Friendship Center at one point, he said, uh, if I have to give up my hard fought rights uh, to the eel to ensure that it will survive and reach your territory, I'm prepared to do that. Uh, that was, uh, to me, that was a profound uh, thing to have said uh, because I know how hard it actually, the court case ultimately in my view cost him his life uh, that and the fact that he was incarcerated for a crime he didn't commit. Um, but uh, So he passed away a couple of years ago. Um, I, I touched, for us, the eel is, is part of Genoa Daganuk, and within Genoa Daganuk, or the relationship to all of life and the sacred elements, uh, it encompasses our responsibilities. And one of the things that uh, a, a wampum belt that was created um, in the early 1700s recognized that the French and English who we were sharing the land with, we said in the wampum belt that we would share the land, but we share the responsibility of caring for the land. And so the, the, there were three human figures on the, on the belt the, and the human figure in the center uh, it represents at least the contemporary interpretation from 
uh, our elder who is carrying it, William Commanda, is that that represents indigenous people and what some people refer to as traditional knowledge, uh, what I would also uh, refer to as a way of knowing. It's another way of processing information uh, and it's also a way of, of, of knowing not only intellectually but knowing um, through, of course, a physical relationship. That's common in Western science as well, but also emotionally or empathetically and spiritually. And that's critically important. That, that balance, that helps us understand our responsibilities and to care for other species and recognize that if we only look at our relationship through our own needs, we may get into trouble and ultimately we won't survive. And we share the responsibility and the view that we have to look seven generations ahead and consider that whatever we're doing to Mother Earth, will it have a negative impact on generations, seven generations hence? So that's, a, that's an important consideration. Uh, for sustainable development. And the reason I bring up a uh, way of knowing as opposed to traditional knowledge is that way of knowing uh, suggests that um, we adapt, that we recognize that the climate is changing, that we recognize that we have done things that need to be changed. Um, and quite frankly, uh, here in the US, when it comes to uh, looking at the impacts of some of the decisions we've made uh, on our rivers, I think you're way ahead of us. Um, I, see, I see mitigation, I see an understanding, I see uh, tribal uh, partnerships with others to restore uh, um, watersheds and to recognize the value of aquatic species and place that in some cases over the, uh, uh, the pressure that comes from looking at energy requirements. Um, I want to hear from the rest of you, uh, and, and I'm, I know that, the, that Tina and Eli have expressed that same thing. Before I do, I just I want to thank uh, the Smithsonian. Um, I want to thank Tim Johnson, who I've worked with, and, and Tim has consistently been dedicated what I consider which the most important responsibility we share, and that is to care for Mother Earth with a view for seven generations. And so this Living Earth Festival uh, is an opportunity to share and consider and think about our children, their children, seven generations uh, away. So, um, I, uh, and Tim, I, I want to thank all of uh, all of your staff who've treated us wonderfully. It's uh, it's been a great opportunity. I find I walk around to the booths, and uh, it's hard to peel away. You know, occasionally I've had to be peeled away uh, to make it to my uh, to the next deadline. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn things over. Uh, I understand. Well, I see um, a microphone, uh, at least one in the back, and if anybody feels, uh, whether it's because you're physically challenged, uh, whatever your reason is, it doesn't matter, if you have trouble going to the mic, feel free to raise your hand, uh, ask your question, I will repeat it so that um, you have an opportunity to express your question or your comment. So um, I'll, I'll just stay, well I guess I have a mic there, I might as well join, join uh, my fellow panelists, and we'll just take your questions from over there. Thank you all for your presentations. Uh, my name is Jerry Williams, and I work at the University of the District of Columbia College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability, and Environmental Science. And I also edit a magazine from the water Resources Research Institute. And I wondered uh, from your comments if you know if there is a concerted effort from Native peoples around the hemisphere who are recording their observations about climate change and if there's some kind of registry where all of this information and knowledge is being captured. I think that would be very valuable.
What uh, that's a great question. And it also expresses a great need. I know um, we have uh, an Eastern Ontario First Nations working group. And uh, I also sit on the um, uh, an International Indigenous uh, Forum for Biodiversity. It comes up all the time in those different venues under the uh, CBD, Convention for Biodiversity. It's something we talk about constantly. But in terms of uh, a repository uh, for what we're observing, I think there's a great, great need. And in Canada, what has happened is that, that some of the Western science systems for um, recording that information, and, and some of those systems were recording First Nation uh, information. In fact, First Nations have been very strong partners in the collection of some of that data. Some of those systems have been dismantled because of the political agenda. It's a great tragedy as far as I'm concerned. But it underscores uh, a need that we need to, to address. We need to find a way uh, to deal with that. I know, I know that there are some uh, indigenous NGOs where that very question is prominent on their agenda and something we have to, uh, have to deal with. I'm, I'm personally not aware of any repository, and I think what has, um, I think what's going to be important in the future is that uh, there wasn't recognition or appreciation for indigenous knowledge, and partly because, uh, and I, this won't be news to anybody um, probably sitting here on this panel, but most of what we're told often is if it's not written down, it's not true or it's not important. And most of our culture and our history and our information has never been written down and may never be written down, at least not to the degree that some people would like it to be done. However, as I mentioned before, the some of our staff are beginning to do studies and do research. and and um, that research is being tapped into not only for our very close regions but in a broader spectrum to see how that research may be applied to other local areas and i can see at some point in the future that um, when we can get past um, the politics and that certainly is a consideration and enough money is put to it that that repository will both be um, very comprehensive and very important to um, bringing back those traditional foods. The, the nonprofit that I work with, Ecotrust Canada, we have a sister organization in the United States and the bioregion that we work in is basically the Cascadia region from uh, southern Alaska to northern California. And at that level, we're, we've, one of the tools we've developed is called Living Atlas, which is an online interactive forum for uh, capturing traditional knowledge and also observations about, about changes that, are ha that is happening. So, but on the, on the broader scale that you're talking about, I'm not aware of the repository. And individual communities have to choose to use the, the Living Atlas, but it can be a tool um, for capturing that knowledge and those changes. Thank you for the question. Chair. Sure. Hello, good afternoon. My good name afternoon. is Bob Goff. I'm the secretary of the Intertribal Council on Utility Policy out of the Dakotas and Nebraska, the Great Plains. But my heritage descent actually comes from uh, around the Raritan Bay, New York Harbor, via the uh, Lenape, the, actually those of who moved up to Montreal, and then some came back to the homeland after the French and Indian War. So there's, there's that history going on, but um, we've been working with the, um, the um, IPCC on, and also the U.S. National Climate Change Assessment, and there has been come an increased recognition through that process of the value of um, traditional ecological knowledge, if you want to call it that, and I really prefer the indigenous ways of knowing because it's, it's still going on. It's not something concretized in the past and only found in written records somewhere, but it's still going on. It's, it's a constant, continuous process from, from communities that are still here and are still interacting with the environment. And we've been heartened a bit on the state side with groups like the uh, Bureau of Reclamation, 
that for years came to the Great Plains and tried to remake the Great American Desert into this big agricultural area and, um, and dammed the rivers and did all of these kinds of things. And they are now, by their own policy, saying in the next 10 years, we'd like to be known more for, as the Bureau of Restoration. And that has given an opening for the tribes to partner with the agencies in ways they were never able to do that before because they weren't on board with all the dams and the, the reclamation of the West. But the restoration of ecosystems gives the tribes a new role to play in a partnership with the federal government down here. And we've seen that the work that's been on the last 10 years on indigenous knowledge and the like in the climate IPCC process, in the national climate assessment process, has moved up the food chain, gone internationally, certainly with the circumpolar communities as well, and has come down through the IPCC to countries all around the world who are going to their indigenous peoples to talk about what are some of the strategies for mitigation? What are the ways that you handled drought in the past? What is the ways that you culturally handled this issue and that issue? And looking at adaptation opportunities. So I just wanted to put that on the table. There's, there's no single repository that I know of either, but there is a way that this appreciation for these ways of knowing are growing in certain areas throughout the, the world and international uh, government, especially around climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, is this on? Okay, it is. Um, I've got a lot of questions, but maybe I could just start out with a few, and then if others have them, then I can come back. But a couple for Larry McDermott. Um, how much money is going into the American Eel Restoration Program? Uh, that's one question. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned the Canadian uh, Endangered Species Act. I was wondering what the fate of that law is under the current government, whether there's been attempts or uh, uh, repealing uh, of, of that and other uh, fishery protection and so on. Maybe you could just give an update. What has actually happened? Okay. Um, the SARA, which is a Species at Risk Act federally, then we also, in Ontario and in other provinces, because in the uh, governance system in Canada, uh, most natural resources are the responsibility or purview of the provinces. Now territories, they're still, they fall under uh, federal jurisdiction. Uh, certainly federally, uh, fisheries regulations under the Fisheries Act and uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans uh, in the recent budget were greatly cut, um, just profound impacts. On, uh, and in my view, they were already weak. Now they're very, very weak. Uh, but the species at risk legislation is linked to certain treaty obligations internationally, like the Convention on Biodiversity, so they're a little slower uh, to cut that. Uh, you know, will they find ways? Um, fortunately, at the federal level, there's a very strong uh, indigenous subcommittee, and when it comes to the American eel, they've uh, put forward some very strong recommendations to the minister. It'll be very very interesting to see what happens in the next couple of months uh, on that front. Um, what I feel is happening is it's it's a, almost an opportunity for First Nations, uh, those that have invested in uh, environmental regulation of any kind, um, are going to become more and more important. Uh, there are other reasons for that. Uh, there's some human rights decisions, including the declaration just last week by the uh, Association of Statutory Human Rights Commissions, which includes the Canadian as well as the provinces and territories for all levels of government to implement the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, and there is very quickly a body of law, jurisprudence, et cetera, that suggests that there are opportunities, particularly where First Nations can get together, uh, to help push 
the bar back to where it was in terms of protecting uh, fish and, of course, other species, and not only species at risk, but to have a more, uh, well, back to the seven generational view. Are there other other questions? Yes, go ahead. I had please. a question. I'm Cynthia Drew. I'm an environmental natural resources attorney, and I've um, had some Indian law cases, like with my co-counsel. Here in the D.C. Circuit Appeals, we had established Clean Air Act tribal jurisdiction in a case mm -hmm. we argued and won here. So I was interested in your talking about the legal authorities. I'm a mediator now, and when you said that many, you, you felt that some of the partnerships were further along in this country than, than you'd experienced on some of the resource issues, I wondered if you had as much of an emphasis on a collaborative, mediating, facilitating approach with all the partnerships at the table. And I also wondered on your issue of the oral history and the food gathering. I mean, I don't think Western cultures had an oral tradition since Shakespeare's time, so that tends to be the unvalued. But I think in these processes that can go on deliberatively and collaboratively for some years, perhaps you have a better chance of, of getting at those issues. Mm -hmm. uh, some great questions. Uh, maybe I'll quickly respond and then I'll turn it over to you guys. Um, for one thing, in, in, um, in Canada, we had a supreme, couple of Supreme Court uh, decisions, Dagamu, Sparrow, uh, that recognized the value of uh, oral history and oral uh, um, knowledge. And in fact, they said in many cases, because it's vetted through a community, that it's, there's a collective responsibility for the accuracy of that knowledge that may even be superior than any other source. So uh, again, when we're referring, and you, you being a lawyer, I may get myself in trouble here, but in, in, in looking at jurisprudence uh, and looking at, at that history, uh, we can uh, make reference to, no, wait a minute, you've got to listen to our community's oral history, and you have to give it equivalently to Western science, or even the manipulation, of course, of that Western science. Because of this gentleman's earlier question of the dismantling of environmental uh, protection legislation, I see us now having a greater role, uh, and we better assume that role, um, because uh, the protection of, uh, of Mother Earth needs us to do that. And we're actually, I've, I'm finding Western scientists coming, I get emails every day saying, help, help, please jump into this. Uh, so uh, there's that situation. Your other part of the question, oh yes. I think in terms of the examples, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the Gulf of Maine project, I'm thinking of West Coast salmon protection regimes where dams are being taken out. West Coast where they, uh, where there's a collaboration with tribes, municipal governments, conservation groups, uh, tourism uh, businesses, and so they made an adjustment to ensure that four endangered species um, would have fish passage uh, up uh, uh, inland waters, rivers. And after about four years, they found that the benefits far exceeded their expectations, even on the economic front, that tourism became robust because eagles came back, um, fishing was better. Uh, so all kinds of opportunities uh, that uh, are attractive to people to come to uh, rural areas um, suddenly became much more vital, much more robust than they were before. And they found that the water quality improved much more rapidly than they had, uh, had thought would happen. So there were all kinds of unplanned benefits, um, and uh, it's a great story. Uh, and I know that there are other stories. So what you're, what you're talking about, to me, part of your question, which I'm not going to have time to answer, is why did it work in that particular case? Uh, I have my feelings about that. Why does it work in other cases? Well, I think it behooves us all to figure out how to make partnerships work and look at those success stories. Could do a workshop on that alone. Thank you for your question. But uh, Tina or Eli, you want to? Well, one of the things that um, the Select Tribe has recently had a book published about our tribal history called The People Are Dancing Again. And mm -hmm. it 
takes you from pre-contact time through approximately 2010, so a very broad spectrum of time. And uh, I mention it because uh, the professor, Charles Wilkinson, wrote the book, and he found it, he, he, did, he took a very unique approach to writing the book. He's written several books about Indian history and Indian law, and in fact, practices Indian law and um, was one of the co-authors that rewrote Felix Cohan's Indian Law Guide. And so he's very knowledgeable, but, but his approach to writing this book about our history was that he and his research assistant spent uh, almost three years doing research and well over a hundred personal interviews with tribal members about the tribe's history, about um, many different issues that he wrote about in the book. But he wanted to qualify it and say that um, he couldn't rest on the laurels of just listening to the oral histories. He needed to find documents, research documents, documents, historical documents that would back up the oral histories. And when when he would find, if he found an inconsistency, he would have to go with what his documents would tell him. And um, it took him six years to finish that book. He didn't, he, that was well beyond his expectation of what it would take him. But when he presented the book to the tribe and he, re, he requested and received complete autonomy in what went in that book, because he said it would have no value if it was just a book that we asked him to write. It had to be a book that he could write autonomously, um, and yet he still took the time to do the research. And in the end, what he said to us is that um, in no instance did he ever have a case where the oral history conflicted with the documents that he was able to find. So those oral histories are very important, um, and uh, I think that they're quite accurate, and they're accurate because um, they have to be. And I think it's important that other groups take the time to do that, those oral histories, even though sometimes they're time consuming um, and sometimes they seem off subject, but they're not. They're all very relevant and they're very important. And I think um, some of what what we have found in, in our own past are things that people did with the best of intentions that actually had harming effects. And one of those, um, and we'll never, we've never been able to get the agency to acknowledge it, but one of the things that happened when they were studying the decline in the salmon population, our elders talked about um, the, a state agency coming in and um, they mistakenly thought that these eels who attach themselves to the salmon and ride up the streams until they get where they want to be and they release. There was a misunderstanding about what those eels were doing and they actually thought that the eels were killing the salmon. And they weren't looking at other factors, but they thought that the eels were killing the salmon. So they came in and they um, poisoned the rivers to kill the eels. And it did, in fact, kill the eels. But it also killed many, many other species that were in the rivers. And those included freshwater clams and mussels and all kinds of um, invertebrates and things that were in the water. And it's taken almost 30 years for some of those species to start to return. And um, we call them crawdads, you, I think they call them crayfish or something else, but anyway, some of those species are only now just returning and those systems are replenishing, but you can see what a length of time. And you won't find that in any documents that we have. It's something that we've been told orally from our, our ancestors, from our, our uh, <laughs> elders that talked about what happened because they saw, they were there, they saw what happened. We know that those things have occurred, but we also know you can't find those in anybody's book because nobody wants to admit to having done that, but it did occur, and it has had a big impact, and it's through those stories 
and those retelling of those stories that we can remember what we did right, what we've done wrong, and what we need to do in the future. So a couple of thoughts. Uh, in Canadian constitutional law, we have a bit of a, a similarity in the unwritten conventions and parliamentary privilege that carried over with British common law in Canada. So we can always point to those things. They went further in Canada to create uh, Section 35 of the Canadian Constitution, which recognizes and affirms Aboriginal rights including uh, Aboriginal right to self-governance. And so uh, we've sort of enlivened that uh, aspect of Canadian constitutional law in different ways. I mentioned earlier that we do litigate with the province and the federal government, but that's not the only approach and we can't always be litigating. So there's other ways that we've worked to articulate and implement what self-governance is for us and embedded in that is the significance placed on and, and respect for oral tradition um, and at the same time endorsing new medias and new technologies for for capturing that knowledge and conveying it to the next generations so, Great. anybody else uh, go ahead I know we're kind of pushing uh, in into a little bit of overtime, but I'm happy to. Uh, just uh, well, well just, you go ahead. I'm not trying okay. to cut you short. Uh, I'm just, just saying. Just a question. You mentioned uh, 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 river saving, and, and I was wondering if you were t tabulating some of the uh, uh, organized opposition to dams in Canada, where it's coming from, because I, uh, you mentioned the success in the U.S. We have, over the last hundred years, removed a thousand dams half of them in the last 40 years, about Yeah, and it expanded the, uh, the protected river system from eight to over 250 rivers uh, that are off limits to river engineering, diversion dams, and so on, a and over 200 major uh, projects of these river engineering schemes have been uh, beaten by organized citizen opposition, starting primarily in the 1970s. So, the United States, that used to be the leader in river destroying, has turned around, but other, other countries seem to be replicating all the mistakes. And um, to reiterate what you said on the dam removals, water quality and fisheries have come back a lot faster than, than most of the experts thought that would happen. Uh, so um, I'm interested in, in hearing if there is some much more organized opposition uh, or where, whether it's Hydro Quebec that's doing most of the damage, or what is what is the status of the river opposition to dams in rivers in Canada now? Okay. Um, do you guys maybe we should reverse the order here? Well, just quickly in Western Canada, there's the Western Canada Wilderness Committee that has a sort of blanket policy against damming. Uh, the larger dams, of course, have some obvious problems, but the, danning, the damming of smaller uh, rivers and creeks for microhydroelectricity generation has also become problematic. It has sort of uh, a cumulative impact on water quality and different species. Um, so that's one organization that's working sort of Manitoba and West. Um, the energy project that we did was actually sanctioned by them. Uh, we, did, we designed our project in a way that um, we took into consideration all, the, all of the challenges and we met the highest environmental standards for design, uh, not, not impacting, not changing water temperature, not, 